Welcome to Bookish, Meet the Author. I am your host, Ebony Haywood, and this show is created by Clarissa Burt. I am here today with author Debbie Peterson. How are you, Debbie? I'm great. How are you today, Ebony? I'm doing good. I know we were just chatting a bit, and you're, um, like, are you three hours earlier than California? Yeah, right now we are. So wow. it's early on a Saturday for me, yeah. What a trooper. I am very appreciative <laughs> of you being here. And today you're going to talk to us about your book, The Happiest Corruption, Sleaze, Lies, and Suicide in a California Beach Town. I have to tell you that title sounds like a the perfect summer read. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think it would be a very good read. It's a true crime story, and it's the story of the crime I found when I became the mayor of my town. Um, and it's, it is quite a story, and in the, everything that's in the title ha actually happened. Well, let's d dive right into that then, um, Debbie. So uh, this is, I mentioned the title, very engaging, it gets your attention like right away. Can you tell us a little bit about how you came up with this title or the history of the title? Sure. In 2011, Oprah said that our county, our county seat, San Luis Obispo, was the happiest city in the world. Well, maybe not the world, maybe the United States. And um, and she's right. It's a really happy, beautiful spot, kind of kind of undiscovered. But there's a lot of corruption. And so the happiest is about Oprah's uh, dubbing us the happiest. And the corruption is about the corruption that's there because no one's paying any attention because we're all too happy. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Yeah, that's so true because a lot of times we see things on the surface level. So everything looks all gravy. And then when you look underneath, you see all of the stuff that is just kind of like percolating underneath that. Mm at the layer of like smiles. So how did you find out about this corruption in your community? I actually found out about it from people came to me and told me about it, number one. And number two, I sat, when you're on the city council, which I was for four years before I actually um, was elected mayor, when you're on the council and as mayor, you sit on a lot of different committees. And when you sit on those committees, obviously I've had a lot of experience. I'm a businesswoman. So uh, you, you begin to see the culture and you begin to look at the accounts. And I noticed that nobody was paying any attention. The other council members and mayors who were sitting on the boards had no idea what was going on. They didn't know their roles and responsibilities. And I would ask questions and they weren't very popular. <laughs> and yeah. So of about four out of 16 of those committees, I found, um, they were just wide open for corruption if they weren't already corrupt. And, and a lot of it, I think, was simply um, council members and mayors didn't know their roles and responsibilities, and they weren't exercising oversight. They weren't asking questions. And so that began to, that, I began to have a few questions about that. Because mm -hmm, mm -hmm. if someone doesn't know their role and responsibility, then obviously they're not doing their job with fidelity. And then you can have, that kind of opens the space for all kinds of chaos to Happen. Yes, that's right. Yeah, absolutely. And they should be overseeing the chief executive, obviously, who should be overseeing their people. But if the board isn't overseeing the chief executive, it's not, it's less likely the chief executive is going to be overseeing his people either. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So in battling the corruption in your community, you did work alongside members of the community, many citizens. How did you go about identifying corruption in local government? Well, it's, it's interesting. I, I started researching it, and I found that my grandparents back in the 1930s, uh, my mother told me this three weeks before she died, I found that they had been involved in setting up a completely different um, political party so that they could get out, they could oust a bad political party. And the secret to making it work, and they managed to get rid of a party that had been there for 50 years, a corrupt, a corrupt family that had been running Kansas City for 50 years. And they managed to do it because they got everybody together. And it was a totally motley crew. It was not it, and it was people you would never expect to work with and never expect to meet. So for one, it was women, a lot of women. They had just gotten the vote and they were really eager to be involved in local politics. Um, so they had a huge amount of women, but the Jewish community and especially one rabbi really stepped up and really uh, was the prophet and kept telling everyone there's corruption here. And, um, and then the African-American community was extremely involved, men and women, in the same way that the Caucasian community was, men and women. And, um, 
And so when they got all of the people together working together with one common goal, and it didn't matter what their politics were, their goal was to get rid of corruption, I found exactly the same thing in my town. And mm -hmm. it was just, it was really heartwarming because I made friends with people that I would never have known otherwise. Mm -hmm. And it didn't matter if our politics were very, very different. Um, it didn't matter if it, the diversities of in every way we're so different but that's really what a village is and that's what america is and if we are operating together that way as a village and and our goal is is to have good governance then um then we can get rid of the corruption and that's really how we did it and obviously we had to hold people's feet to the fire and go go to meetings and and um expose information and do a lot of research as well Mm -hmm, mm hmm. You know, a lot of people would say that there is always corruption, like a little bit here, a little bit there. It, it doesn't. It's now no big deal. What do you say about that? I have um, I have uh, friends who are attorneys, and they tend to say that kind of thing. Oh yeah, you know, there's always going to be a little bit. I guess they get kind of hardened to it, um, and if, there always will be. And things are on a spectrum. You know, you get. Um, you get the far right, the far left, and then most of us are somewhere nearer the middle. It's the same way with corruption. And so you get some towns that have a lot of corruption because no one's paying any attention. And then you get some that are really very well run and really good. Even same with the committees I was sitting on. Some were excellent. And um, so it's, it's true. It's true that there's always going to be just a little bit. Mm -hmm. But the truth is also that um, if there's too much, it really affects the quality of life for the people in the town. Um, for instance, I noticed when I was mayor, everybody was, all the other mayors were talking about um, the rehab beds and the mental health beds in their communities. And we didn't have any. And I've, I'm sure part of, we didn't have the money. And part of the reason was because the money was going places it shouldn't go rather than going to serving people. So if it gets too far out of hand and you really need to stop it as soon as you see it, because people who are, are willing to steal will keep stealing and they'll get better and better and better at it if you don't stop it right away. And so, yes, there's a yes and a no to that answer. But the, the most important thing is for, for us as, as a community to pay attention to the people we elect. Well, and that brings us to, to this question, because people think that you can't beat City Hall, uh, but you say that you can beat City Hall. And how do you do that? Absolutely. It's, it's about numbers and it's about passion and it's, it's not a sprint. It's a mm -hmm. marathon. And um, a lot of times people are so passionate and so concerned about it and they burn out because they don't understand that it, it can take years. Even the FBI, when they're researching this kind of corruption, it usually takes about 10 years for them to take it down. And so if, if the FBI takes that long, it's going to take us as long, too. So it's not an immediate thing. But the other thing is people think, oh, I voted, so that's my job done. And in fact, that's your job just started, because once you've elected someone, you've got to make sure that that person you elected is representing you and they're doing what you had hoped they would do or expected they would do. Um, so voting is good, is really good. Marching is fine. Um, but those won't do it. The only way that you really make sure you have good governance is to get to the meetings, pay attention to the, um, to the, sorry, I'm getting a weird background noise here. Um, uh -huh. You get to the meetings and you pay attention to the minutes, you pay attention to the agendas, you read the packets and you listen. And then, and then you talk, you speak, you say your piece and you learn how to do it and do it well and do it in your two or three minutes that they give you. And if you can do that, you can make a difference. And if you have bad representatives, it, it holds them a little more accountable when you're all there. And um, if you have good representatives, then they understand what it's like on your street. Because unless you tell them, they have no way of knowing what it's like where you live, what it's like on your street, because they don't live there. So it is really important to go and to speak and to, um, to, to read the agendas and to ask the questions. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Debbie, tell us where we can learn more about your book. Where can we find your book or learn more about you? Do you have a website? I have a website. It's debbiepeterson.com and that's Debbie with an I E D E B B I E Peterson, which is P E T E R S O N.com. And you can link to the book there, but you can also go to Amazon. And if you just uh, search 
happiest corruption on Amazon, it will come right up. Um, it's also available online at Barnes and Noble. Thank you so much for joining us sure. and sharing about your book and about our role in our uh, local government. And I think it's the same in our in our national government, right? You, you vote, but then you have to hold your uh, electors to the fire. So thank you so much for that. And I will chat with you in a minute, but we're going to say goodbye to our audience. Thank you so much for tuning into this episode of Bookish, and I will see you next time. Bye-bye.